So now I'm going to talk about <coughs> corals specifically, then about like coral of the animal, and then corals as a habitat. Um, when you classify organisms, they have um, a scientific name that when you refer to it, you usually just use the genus and species, but those are the last two levels in a bigger hierarchy. So you have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And kingdom would be like animals, plants, bacteria, fungus, or protists. And then phylum, the next level. So uh, corals are in the animal kingdom. And their phylum, different phylum would be the cnidarians, like corals and jellyfish. Uh, the annelids are segmented worms, so earthworms, or Christmas tree worms, or annelids. Um, Mollusks, so snails or octopus, uh, echinoderms, <coughs> and on one of those sheets I gave you, uh, the one, I, does it say Puaco and Tide Pool, or something like that on the top? Yeah, so that one has, I think, five different phyla that um, you would find in Tide Pools in Hawaii, and then some examples of those, some, exa some examples of species. Uh, but the cnidarians, the corals, uh, so what are the things that set them apart from the other creatures? Um, they have one tissue layer that surrounds a stomach with one opening and that opening is surrounded by a ring of tentacles and then when they are adults um, the adults will have either a polyp form like that like the corals like this like a sea anemone or they'll have a medusa form like a jellyfish where the mouth and the tentacles are facing downwards uh, but corals um, stony corals, anyways, one of their other unique features is that they're a calcifying organisms, so they create a calcium carbonate skeleton. Uh, it's, it's an external skeleton, it's just a structure that they build uh, so that they can get closer up to the sunlight, so they can get the branches way out, so they can feed on uh, plankton floating around the ocean or whatever reason. Um, and then all the polyps will live on the outer edge of that. So if you see one break broken open, you'll see that there's nothing living inside it. It's just uh, empty minerals. Unless you find like a burrowing organism or something like that. Uh, one of the other things, though, that sets cnidarians apart are their stinging cells called nematocysts. And these are, they're on the tentacles, you can have thousands or millions of these tiny cells. Um, and what they do is if something brushes across the top here, it trips a little trigger, the operculum or the cover opens up. And these are, when, when they're unfired, they're actually inside out. And then when they fire, they shoot out. So if it was like you reached in to, through the ankle of a sock, grab the toe and pull it out through the ankle opening, it just flips right inside out. And those are almost always covered with some type of neurotoxin. Uh, with corals, at least corals in Hawaii, the stinging cells are too small to affect humans, uh, but they're big enough to grab certain types of small shrimp and other plankton that will be floating around. Uh, jellyfish have longer ones. Um, have any of you guys ever been stung by a jellyfish? So sometimes it kind of feels like you're getting electrocuted, but it's just thousands of tiny little needles stabbing into your skin and releasing a neurotoxin. Um, some of the neurotoxins are deadly to humans, like the Irukandji box jellyfish in Australia. Um, but our most dangerous one are the uh, Portuguese man of war, which isn't very common on the shoreline. Have any of you guys ever seen any out here? Okay, because I, I was at Mona Lani a few months ago and I got stung all down the face and arm and everything. Um, so I know they're here, they're just not very common. Are they the same as a box jellyfish? They are not. Um, Box jellyfish are uh, in the family Cubozoa, inside the Nidarians uh, family. I think Portuguese man of war, I don't know if they're, they're hydrozoans or hy, is that, I don't know. That's, uh, Portuguese man of war is actually a colony of like three different types of animals that all live together. And I don't know uh, the exact details of that. I just know they hurt. <laughs> and, and they have very long tentacles because it was the whole length of my body and wrapped around an angle too. So, um, so yeah, that's, so that, they use those uh, both for defense and to catch food. So jellyfish like floating out in the open ocean, uh, fish don't swim by very often, but if they bump into the tentacle, that stuff stuns it fast and then they 
use the tentacles to pull it into the mouth. And the corals do the same thing, they use the tentacles to pull uh, stuff into the mouth. And the mouth is the only opening, so they swallow it, they digest it, and they just spit it right back out. Uh, spit the waste right back out. Um, so, uh, corals are colonial organisms. Most corals are colonial organisms. So, back here, this would be one individual coral polyp, or one coral animal, per se. Um, but the way they live is they live together in colonies of thousands. So this is a close-up of cauliflower coral, and each one of these dark circles is an individual polyp. This is a lobe coral. Each one of these little fuzzy bumps is an individual polyp. So there can be tens of thousands of individual coral animals on one coral colony. Um, but the polyps are all interconnected by thin layers of tissue and uh, they share nutrients and growth. So anything that affects one polyp uh, can be shared throughout the whole colony. Um, some people ask the question, is it a, an animal, a plant, or a mineral? And then they say it's all three. Well, coral itself is an animal. Um, it grows on a skeleton, which is a mineral. And I'll get to the plant part in just a minute here. Um, this, is just, this is a mushroom coral. This is an example of a type of coral that does not live in a colony. Uh, these guys are free living, which means they're not attached to the substrate. I'm not sure if they're able to move on their own, but I do know I've seen them in places I never saw them before, and then like two days later I saw way over there somewhere. Uh, but I don't know how I got there. Uh, I'm going to skip some of this. Okay, so um, just briefly, most corals feed at night. So when you see them during the day, the polyps are all recessed down in their little uh, pukas, little holes. That are, they're called calyxes, ca uh, calyx being the singular. And um, all you'll see then is just the thin layer of tissue that covers the outer surface, and then you'll see the little polyp kind of tucked down in there. But at night, the polyps reach out from the hole and they grab whatever kind of plankton they can find floating around in the water. And so there's a couple reasons they come out at night. Uh, one is a lot of the coral predators are uh, active during the day. So by hiding during the day, they can avoid some heavy predation. And then at night, uh, that's when all the food comes up off the bottom. So if you were to go out at night and shine a flashlight, you would see a lot of little tiny things floating around in the water that you wouldn't normally see during the day. And so they use that opportunity to reach out and grab those things. And remember, uh, they are sessile, which means they cannot move. So they have to wait until food comes to them, um, which is why uh, they have so many nematocysts and tentacles, just to make sure that anything comes by, they get a hold of it and can pull it in. Um, but it turns out that corals don't depend only on uh, external food sources. They actually have a symbiotic relationship um, with another organism called zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae is an algae, so that's the quote plant part of it. Although um, algae are not plants, and uh, if you look at the kingdom, uh, animal, plant, fungus, bacteria, um, algae are in the protist kingdom. Uh, but they are autotrophs, meaning they do use sunlight to, uh, to photosynthesize and to produce sugars. So they use the coral as a habitat, as a home. And they use the CO2 from the respiration of the corals to uh, photosynthesize and create uh, sugars and oxygen. And then the excess sugars and oxygen go back into the coral tissue and they're used by the corals for growth. Uh, coral waste um, can also be used by the algae for certain kinds of nutrients. Um, so there's a small note here on the bottom about corals being designed to live in nutrient-poor environments. Um, high nutrient environments tend to lead to water that is not very clear. Uh, so a good example would be California. Uh, California usually has greenish or brownish water, and what's happening there is the current coming down from Alaska uh, causes upwelling along the shoreline and the deep ocean is loaded with nutrients and all those nutrients come up and they flood the water with nitrogen and phosphorus and iron and silica and all that stuff and it causes an explosion in phytoplankton growth. Uh, the more phytoplankton is, there is in the water, the less sunlight that will penetrate. 
Um, and since corals need sunlight, they need to live in an area where there's not very much phytoplankton, hence an area that has low nutrients in the water. And so Hawaii is, in general, uh, a low nutrient environment. Uh, historically, it was definitely a low nutrient environment. Uh, but now, um, you guys are concerned about wastewater and how that's affecting the reef. Uh, one reason, one way that would affect the reef is the nutrient input could cause um, an increase in algae growth that would compete with the coral, not only for space, but also for sunlight. Um, this just shows that the relationship between the zooxanthellae and the coral starts early. So this is a microscopic photo of a coral egg. It already has the algae 